Warning, the following video features stunts performed either by professionals or under the supervision of professionals. Accordingly, Patrick CC and the YouTube community guidelines must insist that no one attempt to recreate or reenact any stunt or activity performed in this video. Life isn't just about having a lot of fun and being really, 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 really cool. Life is about making people happy. Hi, my name is Steve-O. And I make people happy for a living. Steve-O will go down in history as one of the greatest stuntmen to ever live. The 48-year-old is still doing rad stunts even in his older age. He has dedicated his entire life to making other people happy. He is a role model and a glimmer of hope for all people around the world who are struggling. But at one point, his life spiraled out of control. Steve had some really dark years. He was destroying himself, and everyone sat back and watched. I was watching people walk around my apartment, people who were never there. Oh my god, that was wrong. <laughs> he has broken every bone in his body. He has done almost every substance known to man. Deal with it! I'm in the zone! I my neighbor! Block it! That's what gangsters do! His detrimental lifestyle almost reached the point of no return. It is a miracle that he is still alive. Richard Ted Glover and wife Donna Glover gave birth to their new baby boy, Stephen. By the time Stephen was 13 years old, he had moved, in this order, from England to Brazil, where he spoke his first words in Portuguese, to Venezuela, to Connecticut, to Miami, to England, to Canada, and back to England at age 13, where he would finish high school. He moved so much because his father was the president of Pepsi Cola in the South American division, in charge of all operations in Brazil. With such a high position at a global brand like Pepsi, Ted was needed all over the world. Surely, the Glover family was amassing a pretty good fortune. The trade-off for those millions of dollars was spending quality time with the family. On top of Steve-O's father never being around, his mother struggled with alcoholism one of the most vicious and underestimated illnesses affecting millions of people globally. When I was a baby, mom was like uh, not comfortable with me crying on an airplane. And she didn't want to be like that with the loud baby on the airplane. And uh, so she would give me booze. <laughs> so the family dynamic was basically a mother willing to do anything to make solo parenting easier, such as giving a toddler alcohol to calm him down, and a father who was overly authoritarian trying to make up for the times where he was at work and couldn't properly guide his son. It's safe to assume that despite all the wealth being amassed, Steve-O was not living a stereotypical privileged kid life. Every time their family moved, Steve was excited. He saw it as a new opportunity to be cool, to be rad, to make friends, but it didn't always work. It was the sixth grade report card and my homeroom teacher wrote, <clears throat> Steve like desperately craves the uh, you know the, the attention approval you know, of his peers, but everything he does you know in seeking that brings about the opposite result. A lot of young men desperately want the approval from their fathers. Since that wasn't happening, he turned to his peers. When he wasn't getting their approval either, he went to extreme measures. On October 25th, 1987, Steve figured out he could do anything he wanted as long as he wanted it badly enough. His favorite band, Motley Crue, was performing in Toronto on their Girls, Girls, Girls tour. Steve figured out the name of their manager, Doc McGee, and scoured through the yellow pages calling every single hotel asking for their room. 13-year-old Steve-O snuck out of the house to go and meet his hero, Tommy Lee. Steve loved the anarchist lifestyle, so he started acting out more, getting in trouble, and being rebellious. That's when he discovered his love for skateboarding. Steve's father won a video camera in a corporate golf tournament, but left it in his closet collecting dust. When Steve got into skateboarding on the streets of London, he now had a tool to document his newfound love. Skateboarding calmed Steve down a little bit. His father thought this passion would keep him out of trouble, and it did, temporarily. Immersed in the hesh outsider culture of skateboarding, Steve took it a step further. He approached the stoners from his school looking to get his first high. He wasn't peer pressured, he wasn't tricked, he went looking for it. Almost immediately, he was hooked, which quickly progressed into a love for alcohol consumption. Before graduating high school, he was already suffering from addiction. I know a lot of you watching are aspiring artists who need quality instrumentals. Allow me to introduce Beatopia, which is the first beat subscription website for rappers and singers. It's basically Netflix for beats. Beatopia has a massive catalog of instrumentals catering to multiple genres such as trap, afro beats, and future pop. You can download five full MP3, wave, and stem file trackouts 
for just $15 per month. And you can release your creations on all platforms, get unlimited streams without paying anything extra. All beats are professionally produced and mixed with producer credits including Katy Perry, Gunna, Skepta, and many more. Click the link in the description to sign up, and don't forget to check out the high quality beats at Beatopia.com. All of Steve's peers were attending Ivy League universities, but Steve's eyes were set back in America at the University of Miami, one of the biggest party schools in the nation. In order to be accepted to the university, he had to write an essay. He wrote a one-page redemption story that went something like this. The moral of the story uh, in, in this essay that I wrote was that you know, my mom's like an alcoholic, and I, I want to come to the University of Miami to really make something of myself. He got accepted. Little did they know, college was not going to be his redemption arc. He was getting kicked out of dorms, partying, destroying property. After one year with an impressive .79 GPA, Steve dropped out, but at least his dad didn't waste a bunch of money on tuition. Homeless, couch surfing, skateboarding, jumping off Steve-O did anything for a little bit of attention. Then he would drink through the night to hide his demons. But in 1993, he decided to get serious with his stunts and maybe try to pursue a real career as a stuntman. He moved to Albuquerque with his sister Cindy and decided to apply to the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Clown College which is actually free to attend if you manage to be one of the 50 students they accept per year. As goofy as it sounds, this was probably the most valuable learning experience of his life. He learned how to perform professionally, how to do stunts and make people laugh. Clown College had no grades. You passed if you made people laugh and entertain them. Those were basically two of Steve's strongest qualities. The graduating class of 1997 was the last group of clowns to ever graduate from the Ringling Brothers College. His father did not attend his graduation because he didn't want his son to be a clown. However, his mother went and was very proud of him. Steve would not go on to pursue a career with the Ringling Brothers. He did leave college with the most vital and career-defining transformation, his new name. Steve-O. We know that Steve's longtime passion was skateboarding, so Steve-O did everything he could to make his mark on skate history. No, he didn't hit the parks every day. He did the most outrageous stunts that could be included in videos and magazines. Big Brother Magazine, a publication for the misfits of the skateboarding world. Nothing was off limits. Consistently pushing the boundaries of the First Amendment and cosplaying as an action sports magazine, they had a team of writers in charge of traveling the USA, finding rad stories, and documenting them. Steve-O was desperate to get an article about him, so he set himself and burned half of his face off. By the way guys, I'm sorry for constantly censoring myself, but YouTube is literally age restricting and limiting my ads on these videos for like the smallest things, so I apologize. To no surprise, this worked. He networked with the Big Brother crew, which included Jeff Tremaine, Spike Jones, and of course, Johnny Knoxville. They couldn't stand Steve-O, constantly wanting attention. His chaotic energy, raspy voice, and drunken sloppiness was a combination sober people could only handle for about 20 minutes before they needed a break. But they all warmed up to him, because he was sweet deep down, didn't mean any harm, and was literally willing to do anything. Unfortunately, in 1998, Donna Glover suffered a bad aneurysm, leaving her considerably disabled both physically and mentally. She lived until 2003, but was compromised to the point that she never truly got to see her son's success. It was at this moment Ted sat down with his son and told him that he had done him a disservice as a father. He didn't want his son to go down the path of being a stuntman, but he admired Steve's dedication and persistence, and pledged to support his career from this day forward. Despite his father's newfound support, the damage was already done. Steve's father had spent multiple weeks, even months away from Steve while he was growing up. He would travel all over the world and be missing from Steve's life. They never had a real relationship. Now that his mother was permanently hospitalized, Steve was alone, surrounded by a bunch of people who were going nowhere and encouraged him to be as wild as possible. His drinking habit got worse, and hard drugs became a bigger part of his everyday routine. In the mid-90s, Tremaine and Knoxville thought, how about we film some more of these ridiculous stunts we've been writing about and remove all the skateboarding? Double down on the chaos that was so wildly beloved by the skate community, which would become Jackass. After some heavy convincing on October 1st, 2000, MTV took a leap of faith and aired the first episode. It was a success. Hospitalizations of teenagers hit an all-time high. Just kidding, but I wouldn't be surprised if that was true. <laughs> Now Steve-O and the Jackass guys were getting rewarded for this behavior, with money and fame. Mostly fame, because it's been reported that Steve-O was making around $200 to $500 per stunt, which was basically just enough money for him to get his next fix. But he wasn't satisfied with chump change. Steve-O was on a mission, and he started grinding. He released the Don't Try This At Home video slash DVD shortly after Jackass aired. This was a compilation of all his crazy stunts from the late 90s that didn't get picked up for the show. 140,000 copies sold. If he sold the video for $7 or more, which is likely, he would have grossed over $1 million. The problem is, Steve probably saw none of that money, which I'll get to in a minute. So welcome to our tour video. Like, 
we didn't even want to have a tour. We didn't know, you know? Like, we got this crazy guy, Nick Dunlap, out of Cleveland, Ohio, who's like, I want to pay you a bunch of money to show up at spring break in Panama City, you know? And like, it's like, all right, dude, you know? What do you want me to do? I want you to show up and get fucking wasted. You know, it's like, yeah, I can do that, you know? Literally getting paid to get wasted. What could possibly go wrong? He decided to turn this into a business venture. The Don't Try This At Home Tour with Wee Man, Preston Lacey, and some other jackasses. This was a multi-city tour where they traveled around North America to perform live stunts. After selling probably $1 million in videos and doing shows in front of thousands of people on top of selling merch, surely they were making boatloads of money. Well, they were, but Steve was seeing none of it. The manager producer of the tour, Nick Dunlap, told Steve that they sold the tour for $10,000. That was what Steve would split with Preston and Wee Man, making his take home about $3,000 for the entire thing. On top of that, they were selling tons of merch every night, of which they received none of the money. It's very possible this tour was generating anywhere from $20,000 to $100,000 per night, and Steve left with $3,000 over the whole tour because he wanted to get f***ed up and be the man. So we went to Mexico in the summer and sold out the largest nightclub in Mexico three weeks in a row. And I thought, man, that was cool. But I was bummed out because I couldn't walk for days after that TV on. And Nick was thinking, how the hell am I going to make this show happen night after night? But it had to happen, man. How did he make the show happen night after night? Pure determination to be the coolest and dangerous guy in the room, and drugs. I just don't think a sober person could handle that much damage to their body night after night. Steve-O compiled the behind the scenes tour footage into a video, Don't Try This At Home Tour video. Displays exactly how crazy their lifestyle is, on stage and off. The stunts never end, the party never ends. 24 seven, Steve-O is living the life of a reckless stuntman. Now that I'm on famous and everyone thinks I'm cool, I'm gonna Myself. Jeff Tremaine and the Jackass franchise is known for being very strict with pay. Nobody got to negotiate contracts, nobody got royalties besides Knoxville. It was a get what you get and don't complain situation. The TV show only lasted three seasons and got Steve-O pretty famous, but Jackass the movie changed everything. When I found out that I was going to be presenting tonight, I came up with the most amazing stunt ever and I'm ready to do it. I told them, but they told me I'm not allowed to pull my wiener out. Don't worry. Did you learn that? <laughs> Forget the money. Steve-O was officially cool. He was the coolest guy ever, which was his lifelong dream. Yeah, what's up? Hey, this is Steve-O. I'm really cool. Nah, I'm just kidding. No way. Hey, see you in the microphone. Yeah, do you think I'm cool? Yeah. Despite all the drugs Steve was doing, the biggest drug to him was approval, was attention, even if it was over the phone with a stranger or for a hotel staff. <laughs> oh my God. He drastically lacked attention from his parents and tried to get it from anyone he could when he walked in a room. You know the miracle video? Pay close attention to this one. I made, it. I made it for my mom, okay? And that's why I've been out of control, dude. steve -O was broken. His mother was now living her final days. He achieved exactly what he told her he would achieve, but she couldn't witness it. On November 7th, 2003, Donna Glover peacefully passed away. She would have been extremely proud of her son. Luckily, Steve-O had some sort of stability in his life. He landed his own MTV show along Chris Pontius called Wild Boys. These two traveled all over the world, would learn about local cultures and traditions, eat local foods, and interact with the local wildlife. By my description, it sounds like just another basic wildlife show. As we know, it was anything but that. It was like real life Beavis and Butthead traveled the globe in G-strings. At about 1,500 bucks a pop, the cockatoo is the biggest ripoff in the pet store. Not only do they bite, they have the most annoying voices in all of the world. <laughs> Wild Boys was the best Jackass spinoff. The stunts were not as over the top, but equally as dangerous. This show was a great way for the mainstream audience to get to know and love Steve-O, because where they lacked in over-the-top grandiose stunts, they made up for with humor and personality. Wild Boys filmed its last season in 2005, and without consistent work, Steve-O was about to enter his darkest years. 
2005 to 2007 would be Steve-O's darkest times. His drug use reached an all-time high, and it's truly a miracle he made it out alive. His drugs of choice were ketamine, cocaine, nitrous oxide, Xanax, but he would do anything he could get his hands on, including, but not limited to, meth, video head cleaner, aluminum cleaner. He recorded everything during this time. He had a massive email list that he compiled over the years with his website. Steve would send the videos of him on drugs, straight up vlogging his downward spiral to everyone he knew. At some point, he realized Nick Dunlap was taking advantage of him, but he released three major projects and did two world tours before he realized Nick was getting filthy rich off of him. After traveling the world with his best friend and releasing two other videos, Steve was finally making money. Unfortunately, this wasn't a good thing because nothing good comes from an addict with tons of money and nothing but free time. This is the life I chose. Am I making any folks? I have to write an email tonight. To 50 cent. But it didn't just happen in the comfort of his own hotels and apartments. He was very obviously not doing okay in his public appearances. He was a guest on a Comedy Central show where he got absolutely wasted beyond belief. But they kind of set him up because they said, We, we thought it'd be fun if you had a few drinks and then came out here and did a stunt. But you I would love that. All right. Steve-O had been getting paid to act out of control getting paid to be a jackass. People didn't care about his well-being. Nobody cared to ask how he was or maybe that he should slow down a bit. His brand, his job, was literally to be a reckless and chaotic individual. You always thought that you would be a failure? Kind of, kind of. It's quite dangerous what you're encouraging kids to do, the jackass stunts. There's more to me than people really know, you know? I'm Get just out of give this guy Get out of here. Dude, I look great right now. Making my dad proud is definitely the, the ultimate high that I chase. I'm just tight with my family, and I, I, can't, I can't help but to disappoint them a lot of the time. But making them proud is the happiest that I can be. Although he was out of control, a danger to himself and everyone around him, and seemingly absent-minded, he was very self-aware. He knew exactly why he was so messed up. He knew how badly he just wanted attention. He knew he just wanted his dad to be proud of him. He had too much pride to ask for help, even though he knew he needed it. His dad admits that he was wrong for being so absent in his life, but Steve-O never actually asked him for anything. Steve-O knew his fate was coming. He even tells a story of hallucinating his own intervention. He knew it was time to get sober, but it still took a little bit of force from his friends. After months of pre-planning, one day Johnny Knoxville and some of the Jackass crew showed up to Steve-O's house and forcibly brought him to a rehabilitation center. He had no choice. Knoxville came over to my apartment with the director of Jackass, the director of photography, the executive producer, the sound guy. It was like the whole crew of Jackass came over to stop me from hurting myself after helping me hurt myself for 10 years. <laughs> I was defiant, I didn't want really any part of it, and then it became clear that this was not a yes or no question. This was a you're gonna come willingly or we're gonna physically beat you up and take you against your will. Knoxville asked Steve-O's father to be there when they picked him up, but he said no. I said no, I'm gonna come out, but I'm not gonna come for the intervention because his jackass friends will do a much better job without me right. than they could possibly do with me. March 10th, 2008 was his first day totally sober. After a week sitting in what feels like solitary confinement, Steve-O started reading a book on alcoholism, thinking about his life. He was defeated. He thought he was a lost cause. He thought nothing worse could happen, meaning the only way he could go was up. He was the perfect candidate for sobriety. He could only improve from here, and that's exactly what he did. Since that day, Steve-O has not consumed any drugs or alcohol. From the day I'm scripting this video, 5,248 days sober. 14 years, 4 months, and 13 days. 172 months. An amazing accomplishment. But after a few months of getting sober, the fog starts to clear. Steve realizes how much of a burden he was, how embarrassed he was, how much harm he caused to his friends and family, all the bridges he burned, all the terrible public appearances. He felt shame. He felt like he worked so hard to get sober, only to feel worse. Very few people stay sober for a yes. long term. Um, it's actually... Uh, like 5% of alcoholics, and the other 95%, they say, die drunk of causes related directly to alcoholism. 
or our respective in drug abuse. The mission of staying sober is a lifelong battle. The toughness of that is grossly underestimated by people today. Luckily, Steve-O has a massive audience of people that still love him. Plus, he didn't just get totally lame afterwards. In fact, some people argue that sober Steve-O was funnier because he was more relatable. He showed his fear on camera in Jackass 3D, which was hilarious. Throughout the past decade, he's still trying to outdo his old stunts and prove to himself that he can be just as rad while being sober. He rescued a street dog in Peru, Wendy, who became his life partner. He became a big animal rights activist. He now owns a small farm that he and his fiance take care of. He went vegan for many years. He even went celibate for over a year to test his strength. He got arrested, sure, but that's because he was protesting SeaWorld. He started pursuing a stand-up comedy career, even releasing a special in 2020, and promoted it by duct taping himself to a billboard. He has an active YouTube channel and podcast that he uses to rehash all his crazy stories and experiences. He connects with people who are in recovery and does his best to extend his help to other friends and celebrities suffering from addiction. He continues to push a positive message and be a role model for all people, let alone people struggling from addiction. It's a miracle that Steve-O is alive. The bravest, hardest, and most badass stunt he ever did was get sober and stay sober.